And uh, now the floor goes to Joao and Sasha uh, for a discussion about DS matrix bootstrap. Uh, Joao, maybe before you share the screen, let me just make a few, uh, let me maybe just say a few words about these discussions and uh, that uh, could be convenient also for the discussions that follow. So, so as uh, I'm sure you know, this, this discussion is something new. We did not have these discussions before. So it's something we are implementing. We are trying out to see how it's going to work. And uh, one of the main goals is to have to give the conference a more informal feel so that uh, we have time to chat with each other and to, uh, to welcome comments and uh, to have more um, interactions between, um, between all of us. The other purpose is to be useful because we have seen that we run out of time often with questions to the previous speaker. So it's very convenient to have more time to ask more questions to uh, the previous speakers. And uh, of course, another goal is to be fun so that uh, we hope that we can have some fun during these discussions. So the format of the discussions goes as follows. So there will be 20 minutes that uh, we told the, uh, the chairs and moderators of these sessions to do as they want. So they can either present some slides or uh, sing a song, whatever. It's a, they have 20 minutes, do whatever uh, to, to do as they please, followed by 30 minutes, which uh, where uh, people from the audience should be able to ask questions, make comments, ask questions to either the, the chairs of the session or other people in the audience. The 30 minutes that should be really reserved for a more relaxed uh, uh, interaction and comments. Now, people should, uh, of course, still raise their hands in the discussion part. And in principle, I will call people. But of course, if João and Sasha in this case, or if any of the coordinators wants to ask to, to call particular people, just override me and, uh, and ask directly, oh, it will be nice at this point to hear uh, uh, this or that person. Uh, otherwise, I will be calling people uh, myself. Uh, keep the camera on, of course, as Nathan said, it's always fun, especially in this more informal meeting, especially if you participate, after you participate, keep your camera on, please. And uh, let me see, I have here a couple, um, one more thing. So, and finally, so there is a Slack channel that we created and do use the Slack channel, not only if we run out of time in this discussion and uh, if you want to keep discussing, but also if you have questions for the next discussions or suggestions of topics that you would like the next people to discuss, do go to the Slack channel and write there and uh, I will make sure that uh, I pass the information or of course the coordinators of the discussions, please join Slack as well. Uh, yeah, the last thing is that, as I said, my role is going to be very, very mild during these discussions. I'm going to try to interfere as least as possible. And uh, we, it's a more relaxed uh, part of the conference. So it's not a big deal if we go three minutes over time. It's also not a big deal if we end five minutes earlier and go for lunch earlier and have some more time. So having said that, I think I summarized everything I want to say. And uh, it's a pleasure to start uh, these uh, discussions with a very appropriate topic for a strings meeting on the S matrix bootstrap. And uh, so João and Sasha, the floor is yours. And please take it away. Okay. Yes, th thanks Pedro for this uh, introduction. Uh, we won't do anything as original as dancing or singing. We just prepared some slides for 20 minutes. But again, as Pedro emphasized, uh, we, we hope very much that uh, we can use this to discuss, to collect ideas, suggestions, to keep it informal. Use Slack. Also, if you don't want to post on Slack, just send an email to us. Uh, so yes, that's, that's uh, uh, the idea. Um, so the, the, the plan would be that uh, we will, for those maybe who do not follow the subject, uh, some of the ideas and questions we already mentioned today, we'll start with a short introduction. Then uh, we would broad a little bit the discussion and uh, state uh, the state of the art in the field at the moment. And finally, we'll come to the, the main, uh, main part, which is the open problems. We also uh, listed them at the end of presentations in the, in the form of questions, and then some hints why maybe we can answer this question. So please also check uh, these ones. So as, uh, as already mentioned today, when we are talking about S matrix bootstrap, we focus on observables. And uh, from, from this point of view, a physical theory is a, is a way to generate these observables in a self-consistent and 
hopefully complete fashion. So from this point of view, it's uh, it's not uh, it's not so important if it comes from some Lagrangian or from some bullshit or from some completely new structure like a volume or something deeper. As long as we we, we can generate these observables, we are, we are happy. And uh, so the three questions uh, which we commonly ask: uh, What is the observables? What is the complete list? And uh, what do we mean by the by the word consistent? And finally, when we agree on on these questions, which are basic questions in the bootstrap, then we can ask: What is the space of such physical theories? Uh, which is a, maybe a more modern version of the old questions: What is the theory? So here we we ask: What is the space of possibilities, and how how can we limit it? using our data and observations. In this case, so here we would like to focus on uh, ADS CFT and, and flat space. And okay, since uh, it's strings, so we focus on gravitational theories. In this case, observables are anchored at infinity. And uh, for ADS, we have a non-perturbative CFT formulation and uh, we can study correlation functions of local operators. And for flat space, of course, we talk about scattering amplitudes. And here, the, the, important, uh, uh, the important difference, which was, has already been used and mentioned today, is that on the, on the uh, ADS CFT side, the, the observables we can study, they make sense both in Euclidean and, and in Lorentzian. So we can go to the safe Euclidean space, study everything there, and then go back to Lorentzian, whereas in, uh, on the flat space side and scattering amplitudes, they, they're purely Lorentzian objects, and that creates all, all kinds of uh, difficulties. So what is the, as we study this local operators of scattering amplitudes, what is a complete set of observables? And on the on the CFT side, the basic operations that we always like to use is OPE. And in this case, we, we can reduce everything to the set of four-point functions. And as we learn how to deal with four-point functions, in principle, we can be as uh, systematic as we like and study larger sets of four-point functions. Uh, whereas on the, on the scattering amplitude side, we imagine our Hilbert space being uh, made of being a Fox space of free particles, and uh, we then can study various transitions. And as you heard today uh, in the first few talks, uh, then we, we always talk or mostly talk about two to two scattering amplitudes and everything goes that goes beyond that is uh, mostly terra incognita. And uh, if we ever want to make it systematic, we will have to, uh, to face this difficulty. Um, finally, what do we, to, to, to set up, the, to finalize the problem, what do we mean by consistent? And here we have on the CFT side set of uh, Euclidean uh, CFT or CFT axioms, which have been recently shown to be in some cases equivalent to the familiar Whiteman axioms. And then we use crossing equations and derive rigorous bounds. On the, on the S matrix sides, the, the rules of the games are much more open. There are things on which we all agree, something like unitarity, symmetries, it could be Lorentz invariants or something like BMS symmetry for gravitational scattering. Then we have causality. And already at this point, what do precisely we mean by causality, how to formulate it, it becomes uh, not easy. And we, we see that in 2021, we still hear some news from that. And then uh, based from these basic principles, there are also more derived concepts like analyticity and crossing. And uh, again, as we, as we heard today, it's still an, uh, an open question. What is the right domain of analyticity? When is the crossing valid, et cetera, et cetera. So now uh, after we agreed on this basic uh, basic set of rules, we play a couple of games. Uh, one, when ask the question, what is the space of theories? So the first is a so-called uh, dual problem. Uh, and uh, here the, the idea is to derive bootstrap bounds or to exclude theories. So we impose all the self-consistency. Here you see some parameter space. It can be a space of Wilson coefficients. And then using these basic principles, we can separate the region which uh, we know cannot be UV completed, which is labeled by null, from the region that could maybe uh, uh, consistent theory. And even though, of course, we do not if there is an actual theory and how to build such a theory, but nevertheless, these are rigorous bounds and uh, uh, they are sharp. The second uh, and another type of game which uh, we can play is to, in fact, uh, try to construct, explicit construct, and 
explicit amplitudes. It's in a little bit in spirit of in the string landscape where we have a model which we believe is consistent. We, we can take a, a, the amplitude, expand it, read off the Wilson coefficients, put them on this plot, and we know that this is allowed. So whatever the general principles are, they, they, they will not be able to exclude it. Now, in, in practice, we can sometimes uh, construct such amplitudes, usually at the level of two to two, um, and then uh, check that they satisfy some conditions. But this is not like constructing a theory, for example. OK, this, if I give you a two to two amplitude, you can ask, what is a two to four? And we don't know if there is a consistent way to combine such thing into uh, together. And that's why there is this question marks and yes. And then uh, if, we, if we again explore some parameter space and with our ansatz, which we believe to be powerful enough, we cannot reach some part of the parameter space. We believe that it's probably not consistent. It's, it's not exactly no, but it's probably not because we believe our ansatz is complete and we have a good control. But uh, that's, uh, uh, that's a situation. Now, uh, I guess I will pass it to Joao, who will, will talk about the bootstrap cube. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. OK, so now let me briefly describe the state of the art using this, uh, this bootstrap cube. So let me, let me start by explaining these two main axes uh, using the interesting theory. OK, so let me tell you what are some interesting theories that we would like to bootstrap placing them in this axis. So one, one example is uh, our confining gauge theories in the planar limit. Okay, so this is, I place it here in massive and perturbative. So here it's important to emphasize that what I mean by perturbative is not exactly the same thing of textbook. So planar scattering amplitudes in the planar limit, they are perturbative in the sense they are small, they are suppressed by one over N. And they are perturbative also in the sense that they only have poles, they don't have uh, branch cuts. Um, but still, they have an infinite number of poles, and there is no simple set of Feynman diagrams that you can use to compute, say, global scattering. Okay, so, so these are the kind of perturbative theories that we would like to bootstrap. And of course, the same applies for massless. So, massless uh, by, by I mean, the vertical axis is obvious if you have a mass gap or not. So the same kind of theories can be used to, com to construct, if you want, classical UV completions of gravities, like three-level string theory. And I will also include here the, the theories that Leonardo was talking about this morning. So effective field theories that are weakly coupled in the sense that we neglect massless loops, but they can actually be strongly coupled uh, at high energy. So, so that's also a set of theories that it's interesting and non-trivial. Then on the upper right corner, we have the most standard cases, just some QCD, finite N confining gauge theory. And uh, well, let me emphasize that this 2D Ising field theory is probably the best laboratory to test methods. So if you want to test some non-perturbative method, this is probably the simplest uh, non-integrable field theory that one should try. And then finally, here on the lower um, right corner, you have the most interesting and most difficult theories where you have full non-perturbative UV completions of, let's say, gravity. Okay, okay so this is, this is a description of this uh, table, this parameter space. So now let me give you the other direction. So analytic results. So of course, let me already apologize. This is gonna be uh, some cross section which will be incomplete for sure. And the references will also be incomplete. So I apologize for that. So crossing symmetry, uh, Sebastian just gave us a, a review. So this is some recent work trying to understand crossing symmetry, especially in the planar limit, even in perturbation theory, but to all orders. Now, another result that I want to emphasize is some universality of these uh, uh, classical amplitudes of higher spin amplitudes, higher spin particles in this particular regime. And then there is not much more that we actually know uh, even in this corner. And then, okay, on-shell methods, well, they are more developed here in the massless case. And I mean, this is clearly a huge literature 
in the amplitudes community, which I'm not going to uh, describe or emphasize in great uh, detail. Here, I will mention more what Leonardo was telling this morning, this positivity bounds, which, well, actually, let me show already like this, which come, well, I put it in these two columns in case you include or you exclude the massless loops, I would distinguish that as perturbative and non-perturbative. So here there's a, a lot of recent, recent progress in this uh, respect. Uh, some of it analytic, that's why I put it here, but actually to be more systematic, many things have to be done also uh, numerically like Leonardo and uh, Simone was explaining this morning. Then this was also mentioned this morning. So in principle, you can derive string scattering amplitudes non-perturbatively from the flat space limit of ADS. So again, this could be in both columns. I put it here because so far this has mostly been used uh, perturbatively. So it's an open question, how much can we use this relation? This was already mentioned this morning. And then here is the upper right corner is a lot of classical results, almost all of them 50 year old. So here, uh, again, the references are clear. Wow. But um, so here, there's not much happening recently. The, the only things that I can, that I could mention is bounds on coupling. So in two dimensions, both in massless and massless, we could derive some exact bounds analytically, but only in very special cases, okay? So the most of the action is happening actually in the, next axis when you do numerical results and uh, well let me show you right away so i already mentioned this description here so there's lots of positivity bounds applied to different types of effective field theories with uh, the technology that uh, leonardo was reviewing this morning and then on this non-perturbative column there is mostly uh, technology based on primal ANSATS. So where we, as Sasha explained, we just explore amplitudes by creating a big ANSATS. And in particular, this is an important point is that we assume maximum analyticity in this ANSATS. And then we can obtain bounds on many observables between scalars, between fermions, even multiple amplitudes we already did in 2D and, uh, and many things in a, in a effective field theories also. So let me just uh, emphasize that there has been uh, this year a lot of progress in constructing also dual problems. So dual problems are also constructed in, uh, in two dimensions already some time ago, but in higher dimensions, this is more recent. And in, par in particular, there is one approach from today by, uh, sorry, by um, Amit and Andrea, that uh, basically really derives, following up on some old approach by Lopez and Menesia, that derives really rigorous bounds without any non-proved, unproven analyticity assumptions, okay? So this is, I think, a very important problem to test all the, the developments. And okay, I pass it back to, to Sasha to discuss some problems. Yes, here, thanks, Joao. Here, we, I would like first to thank some, some of you who already shared uh, your ideas and questions with us. And so we collected them and added some, some other few. And uh, so let me briefly say a few words about uh, these questions to give you some details. So one, uh, one big question, of course, is that if we can use this matrix bootstrap to solve uh, either known theories or to find uh, to find new theories. And uh, here we, we already heard, we know there is a success story in CFTs. And so the question, can we generalize to this metrics? And in fact, it has been done in two, in two dimensions. There are beautiful papers where some uh, known integrable theories were discovered. And uh, the question is, can we do something like this in higher dimensions? Uh, another question, since we have sharp bounds, what are the theories which lives on the boundary? And uh, again, in 2D, this is some known theory. There are some open questions, but there are also interesting examples in high D, which were recently found of amplitudes, which uh, extremize some problem. And then uh, they do not look like something familiar. Uh, and the question is, what are they? And maybe we will have time a little bit uh, today to discuss some of these interesting uh, amplitudes, which do not come from something known. 
Second question, which was again mentioned several times today, is that uh, can we use ideal CFT and especially non perturbative formulation of CFT as a safe harbor? And what can be learned uh, from this about non perturbative S metrics? What are the lessons which are still to be learned from this? We don't, we don't know. Then uh, an important uh, direction is uh, understanding multi-particle amplitudes. If we ever want to make uh, S-matrix program systematic, uh, we cannot always talk about two to two scattering. This isn't just a little corner. And uh, here there are all kinds of questions, analyticity, crossing. There is an interesting relation between uh, scattering and particle production in high dimensions. And there is a question how, how close can we be to have integrable theory in high dimensions theory without particle productions it cannot be zero but how close would we be um, can we derive uh, dispersion relations for high point amplitudes or dispersive sum rules maybe in cft first where we know it better there was also this observation that known theories which are fully consistent uh, at the level of m to n exhibit low spin dominance is it some uh, something important or is it uh, something that happens only in examples then, uh, of course, there is, uh, again, we, we already saw, and there were some questions, what happens in four dimensions. This beautiful formalism of S matrix uh, um, in, uh, that we use, uh, it only makes sense at D larger than five, uh, this, uh, this exclusive way when we talk about two to two amplitudes and equal for the right Faraday divergence, and then we have to construct a infrared finite observables and then develop a, a tools to analyze those and this is an open problem there is also a problem related uh, even at a tree level to the divergence of the graviton propagator in four dimensions and impact parameter space and maybe something we can uh, discuss uh, an obvious thing is a uh, generalization to spinning particles this is a technical thing and probably will be done soon but nevertheless we heard today a lot about sc scalar particles but we want to do gravitons eventually Bounce on the regio limit. Similarly, we have a better control in CFT. We have some arguments in flat space, but presumably we can improve those, and uh, especially in gravitational theories, where we know that even the scattering at large energies and high large impact parameters is, is under control. Uh, another thing is uh, using the UV or data from high energy fixed angle scattering or regio limits, a saturation of Rossar growth. These are, again, the pieces of information which we know are there, but in the current bootstrap approaches, they, they're not used, and it's an open question how to put them in. And finally, maybe open it to really broad and uh, uh, waiting for your suggestions, is well, the question, what are the new targets? Are we asking the right questions? And uh, especially looking into the future, what are the interesting uh, what are the interesting questions, both theoretically or in connection with experiments? There has been work about bounds on the uh, effective field theory of standard model, correction to bounds on the high derivative operators in standard model, or uh, if we can generalize somehow this to cosmology. This is, of course, uh, completely open and uh, would be interesting to discuss. Um, so I think at this point, we would like to welcome uh, everyone to. To, to join the discussion, I guess Joe put a slide again, coming back to this square. Um, and I see already a question. So. Very nice. Thank you very much, Sasha. And uh, let's indeed uh, open uh, Sasha and Joan. Let's thank Sasha and Joan quickly and uh, move uh, right away to uh, the discussion part. I think so one, I one that... thing also. Yes. Uh, during, after Sebastian talk, there was Gabriele and Simon who didn't have time to ask questions. So we can also Absolutely. come back to that. Yeah. 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 We should. Yeah. So uh, she, uh, an old from Harvard, could uh, unmute. Uh, hi. Uh, so, um, of course, we know in CFT, uh, the four point crossing captures almost all the consistent constraints. Whereas, you know, we like to say in S matrix bootstrap, the four point uh, amplitude is not. Far from enough, uh, but uh, but that's of course because we're restricting ourselves to uh, stable particles, which are asymptotic states. What about resonances? It doesn't make sense to <laughs> define non-perturbative amplitudes of resonances, and would they allow us to extend, uh, you know, just with a level of four-point scattering beyond uh, that of you know actual S matrix elements?
So maybe who wants to answer this question? Yeah. Oh, like, yes. But but uh, Sheen, but why why do you think that resonance? Because some theories might not have even resonance, right? How do we? Uh, well, but most theories have lots of res lots of resonances, right? I I mean. Uh, 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 and in fact, of course, in, in real experiments, so most of the amplitudes we talk about are that of resonances. Uh, but I guess the first thing is, uh, are, are they, are the scattering amplitude of resonances supposed to make sense number turbulently? And of course, if, if so, there should be a, a you know, interesting uh, quality to, to study. But uh, I, I'm not actually uh, uh, sure of the answer to that. I would, I would have thought so, but I'm not sure of any kind of rigorous uh, uh, statement. Did you know? I think uh, let me maybe, uh, let me emphasize something. Let me suggest something that if you have your camera on and if you want to participate in a particular topic that's being discussed, <laughs> it helps a lot if you just raise your hand and so on. So for example, Gabriella has his hand raised and I would not be surprised if he has something nice to tell us about resonances, but I'm, I'm afraid that she might, he might be too polite to jump in. So Gabriella, if you want to unmute yourself. Okay, can you see me? or hear me? Can you hear yes. me? Yes, yes. Okay, no, I mean, the question I had for Sebastian oh. uh, was, it, I was a little bit confused. On one hand, he said that planar diagram, for planar diagrams, he could prove crossing, but in string theory, it was a little bit trickier. And so the question to him was, if you have large N uh, uh, QCD, or young meals, uh, what is the situation? I mean, is it more like planar diagrams or is it more like a string? It, uh, the, the answer is it's more like planar diagrams. I should say that also if you assume string field theory is valid, then, then the answers, the, the results would carry on to, to string theory as well in the planar limit. Will that extend to the to a, a topology like the cylinder topology for, you know, uh, with two boundaries? Uh, it would How not. That, to give the Pomeron. It, it would not. So when I when I said planar, I really meant like insertions of... Uh, yeah, yeah. Not a not cylinder. Necessarily. Exactly. Okay. Uh, but sorry, I think Pedro also was asking a question in relation to Sheehan's... Uh, no, 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 no. It's all good. It's all good. I mean. Okay, and then, and then perhaps I have a question actually to uh, to, to the discussion. Uh, where would you put in this um, in this diagram planar unquenched uh, gauge theories, namely with dynamical quarks? This is to Sasha and uh, Joab. Did you understand the question? You mean with uh, so with uh, with massive or massless quark? You you mean with with massless pions with exact goldstones? Uh, yeah, with massless quarks. Yeah, then I think it would go to the ah, but still in the planar limit. You mean in the planar limit? Yeah, if you want in my limit, <laughs> not Tofts. Right. Right. So, but so you will have only poles still. No, 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 not at all. If you have if, if you have quark loops, you open, you know, you have multiparticle production. You cut your diagram. Actually, it's an interesting theory because it satisfies an exact nonlinear unitarity equation, a planar unitarity equation. So for instance, you expect us are bound and things like this. But the simplicity is just you, you just have one quark loop or no? You have many, right? Because it's many, also... many, arbitrary many. Then uh, then it's basically as hard as the, it's like lower lower right corner. Well, since you say planar confining gauge theories, what you really meant is the Toft limit. Right? Yes, yes, that's what no. I meant. That's with poles. The simplifying assumption is that it only has poles. Yeah, that's the... exactly. No, in that case, you don't have only poles. So it will probably go in the, in the next box, right? 
Right. It's, but I mean, forget, possible, forget about uh, massless states. Take for simplicity, you know, light quarks doesn't matter. So you don't have gold stones. But still, uh, I think it's still a, a hard situation. But it's planar. For instance, you you expect to have no red J cuts, only poles, because of some old arguments. On, uh, angular momentum analyticity and and then okay you okay you have only thresholds in the s and t channel for instance and not in the u channel but still it's a complicated situation i i guess yeah i i think it's somewhere in between yeah it has some simplicity but not yet but thanks thanks for uh, raising that uh, that uh, theory Okay. So I would suggest we go to Hiroshi, unless, yeah, you go, let's go to Hiroshi. Yeah, so, so since this is meant to be discussion session, so I have actually uh, questions to Xi, uh, just to follow up, uh, just to uh, the point he was making. So he said, uh, the, uh, she said that crossing, uh, so CFT contains more information regarding four point crossing than uh, scattering amplitude, but it seems to me that uh, the, the space of uh, uh, local operator is much bigger than space of one particle state in scattering. So isn't it obvious that uh, uh, CFT four point contains more information than the scattering amplitude? Am I missing something? Uh, Hiroshi, what, what my, my point was, uh, uh, was, not, uh, was a practical one uh, because it, just because uh, it seems to be technically much easier to analyze four point amplitudes than high point amplitudes, I was suggesting to uh, consider four point amplitude not just of uh, particles but also resonances um, because once you allow yourself to consider resonances uh, which you know have complex masses and so forth um, you might be able to uh, you know be, because in heuristically they are like uh, you know multi-particle unstable bound states and uh, and you might be able to uh, dramatically enlarge the the, the, the set of uh, uh, you know observables you can constrain but, but the question would first have to be, you know, what, what can, do we know about the general analyticity or even unitarity sort of constraints on um, quote unquote amp scattering amplitudes of resonances? Which, yeah, so uh, you have to extend the notion of S matrix in some uh, Right, right. Uh, but, but it's not, it would not be surprising if it can be extended, right? Because for example, if you imagine some eight point scattering amplitude, you group the external particles in pairs and you just end the continuum and try to extract like, some singularities on the uh, second sheet or whatever, uh, you might be able to produce uh, some notion of uh, scattering amplitudes of resonances number turbulently. But that, that's the thing, I'm not sure to what extent this is really well-defined in general, but certainly from the a level of perturbation theory, it's not a, it's, it would not be surprising that, that this thing makes sense. Okay, I, I, I saw the point, thank you. Maybe a, a related comment, maybe if you were to consider double trace, in the CFT, they could be related to jets, right? If you were to consider correlation function of operators that uh, look like products of operators, it would, it could be like scattering jets of particles. It would be another possibility. Oh, one one comment about, about that. Um, I think in in the getting the flat space limit of ADSCT story that, that someone talked about, it was important to be able to focus in the bulk. And I think that if you just use double traces, you won't be able to focus both of the particles. And so presumably you would be forced to consider large sets of double traces, which might be equivalent to a higher point function. Mm -hmm. Simon, maybe. Okay, yeah, let me, well, let me proceed with the question I had for, for Misera's talk. Well, first, first is a comment that uh, the assumption about planarity is very crucial. And there are counterexamples that are known starting from six points. Uh, they exist already at genus zero in uh, string theory, and they have to do with the kinematics not being planar. And, and they, they get, this gives rise to new saddle points, which look like folded strings. So we're not going to detail. I think uh, uh, Sebastian knows that. But my question was, uh, there was a proposal by, uh, referred to it as the Lipetov interpretation of, of crossing, for lack of a better word world, which is that uh, uh, even though the crossing path that you described does not exist, the absolute is still a sum of, is a sum of, a linear sum of things which satisfy nice analytic properties. 
I don't know if you've considered that option. Uh, I, I have not. Let, let me just address first the the first uh, comment. So of course the this is a counter example. The the example that you mentioned is a counter example to the crossing using the specific deformation that I was employing. It does not itself imply that there could not exist other types of analytic continuations. Um, so so it does not rule out crossing by itself, right? Uh, and to, to your to your no, second no, question, no, exactly. And Lipatov's proposal is a specific way to understand crossing. Exa so exactly. Exactly. that. But I, I do not have anything specific to say in that direction. Maybe someone else has a comment. So many other people have uh, their hands raised. So again, I think it's better if people have, uh, have comments or questions that are precisely related to what we are right now discussing. Don't hesitate and. Uh, do as uh, David did and just unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, I will uh, continue calling up people. So just a quick comment or question. Uh, so this question about whether four points suffice, so we need n points, that is not relevant for large gen in the top limit, right? <clears throat> there we just have poles and four points of all the massive poles is enough. Is that fair? In the sense that all resonances are stable, so you have infinite. All resonances are stable. You just you can you can get the higher endpoint by factorization. Actually, I, I I have a question which was which touches upon just what Leonardo just said. I mean, I agree with what you said in the context of um, the vacuum correlators, but suppose I was considering correlators in heavily highly excited states states with energies of order n squared, which would be, for example, interesting if you wanted to consider thermal correlators, which people have studied in the context of bootstrap. Then I think you need some more uh, because, and, but yeah, it's I also agree. I was, I, think, I was in the regime in which n is the largest parameter. So n is, in, is, is effectively infinity and so. Right, but, but you could ask the question about trying to bootstrap uh, thermal correlators in a large NCFT. Yeah, um, and various people have made interesting observations in that context. I was wondering, uh, which, is, which also ties back to Zhi's question, could one, especially in context where you have long lived modes in thermal correlators like hydrodynamics, how much, how much could one say in general from the bootstrap program? Someone, has someone thought about this? It would be. It would, it, well, well, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. I have one quick comment about this, but it's more a question also that I'm sure you know you've talked about, Magun, But uh, like, for example, shear viscosity of various observables in term, around thermal states are defined from two-point functions, and 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 we can't we can't really say anything about two-point functions. But like, if there was a way of reformulate these things in terms of I know out of time order four-point functions or things like this, we might actually mm -hmm. do some things. It's, that would be an interesting question to ask from the hydrodynamics perspective. Well, you, you could, for example, do something that you know very well, which is to look at um, higher transport. Don't look at shear viscosity, but look at higher order transport, which are higher point functions. Um, I, I, I mean, are you worried that it would be hard to get anything which is just a causal response out of uh, no, but you need to go might something take, which might is more order. We might get order. interesting sign constraints. I really have no, no, no idea what you should expect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Maybe we could move to Vladia. Uh, yeah, uh, it's my eternal question to the people who are doing numerical bootstrap. Uh, is there any progress in the search of four-dimensional conformal theories? Of course, non -separate symmetric. Uh, is there any progress or there are some, uh, uh, probably some uh, questions which uh, Bootstrap cannot answer? Uh, maybe Joao can comment on it. Uh, so after this great success of three-dimensional Bootstrap, 
some people, some of you promised to some of us that in four dimensions, the program will be fulfilled very soon. So what is the status of it? Well, I, uh, I'm not sure I'm the right person to give you a state of the art on, on this numerical bootstrap in four dimensions, but um, well, there has been, even in four dimensions, people are already did the were operators with spin a half. And I know that there is ongoing work in setting up bootstrap of a four point function of currents, which might, um, of flavor currents, which might open the door to find some uh, interesting kinks or features in the space of theories. But um, but I, I think we are still working on it. I, I don't know if- uh, Is it not... at least clear that the space of uh such theories is much more limited than in three dimensions. And uh, do you understand the reasons for it? Maybe there is, we, we should hope on some no-go theorem in this direction. But we know that there are some, right? We know like bank zacks. Uh, yeah, everybody, everybody gives this example, but it's hardly it's beyond. <laughs> So far, they did not show up as kinks in, in any numerical bootstrap, but um, I think there's still a uh, work in progress. So yeah, maybe we'll promise for next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Is there any technical difficulty that you can pinpoint? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the, the main thing is that if you do four point function of scalars in 2D and in 3D, you find features in the bounds and in 4D, you don't find it becomes very smooth and featureless. So I don't think we have a deep understanding of the nature of the, the, the shape of the boundary of the bounds a priori. And therefore we have to try with more complicated correlators with spin and that's why it's, uh, it's technically harder. But I don't think we have a deep understanding. I, at least I don't, I don't know. Is it clear that uh, if you were doing an epsilon expansion around 4D, you see features appearing and disappearing? I mean, is there some statement one can make in the in four minus epsilon that, that tells you that four is hard to get. Uh, I mean, not that I know of for this. Uh, well, for scalars, there is a, there has been study across dimensions from, I mean, for the Wilson feature between two and four. And, and we see that even the aisle, even let's say the kink, the simplest case moves mm -hmm. And, uh, and then it becomes smooth in four dimensions. We, we do see that numerically. Although, I mean, the, the numerics in between dimensions is, is a bit, there's an assumption of unitarity, which is not really true in non integer dimensions. But I'm afraid we are uh, kind of deviating too much from the S matrix bootstrap. So, uh, I mean, but it's, it's interesting discussion, but perhaps if we have, I don't know, 10 more minutes, some S more, more S matrix bootstrap questions. For example, targets, if people have suggestions, what, what, what kind of questions we should try to maximize, minimize, for example, uh, production, total production in elasticity. There is something that so far we're just maximizing residues or quartic couplings like values of the amplitude. I don't know if there is some other ideas from outsiders. Uh, Joao, can I uh, ask uh, actually uh, just about related in relation to, to that, uh, but also about the inelastic effects? Because uh, typically, as far as I know, typically in S metric bootstrap business, as when you analyze two, two amplitudes, when you try to maximize something, it becomes elastic. And we know that the much higher than two, it's not supposed to be exactly elastic. And we know, for example, uh, of course, by sewing together two four-point amplitude, you get six-point amplitude, and it gives an inelastic effect, and so on. But uh, the, what is the status in terms of actually incorporating that, say, numerically, in uh, in actually, uh, you know, constraining the four-point amplitude by itself? It, it has, it, you know, 
is this currently uh, actually uh, feasible or uh, I mean? Well, I mean, as you know, we, if we have an answer for an elasticity, it's trivial to put it by hand, right? So this is actually something we're playing with. If we use the black hole ansatz that at high energies you form black holes and there is some small probability of elastic scattering it's suppressed by the entropy, you can just put it by hand, right? You say that the partial wave is not less than one, it's less than some number which you put. But I think what you're asking, if you can do it, it's self-consistently coming from, uh, from two people. Right, four. right. Uh, yeah. But I know Sasha is doing something related, but not, not exactly, but maybe Sasha can comment more on, on what he's trying. Yeah, so in, uh, in uh, what she mentioned is the, this production comes about from imposing um, elastic unitarity. And in, in fact, not, not just elastic unitarity, but it comes from elastic unitarity at large spin in a sense, or in, in complex spin. Or because elastic unitarity can be formulated in terms of partial wave, and this uh, due to frost group of complex and spin, so this is a strong. Now, um, I don't know any uh, uh, any ways that this can be done numerically in 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 a simple way, like generalizing, you know, the raw ansatz. Uh, there are some features that you can that you can impose. For example, you know that from the fact that you satisfy this elastic unitarity and from which this elasticity comes about, uh, the double spectral density exhibits this uh, zero region where it is it has to be zero, which has a very particular shape. So this, for example, we can put in into the primal problem. Uh, there is a way to solve uh, elastic unitarity by uh, using this uh, beautiful methods, again, invented in the 70s, where we can write down non-perturbative unitarity, and then we can use it as a mapping, and then uh, this mapping is uh, convergent to a fixed point, and this fixed point is a solution to elastic unitarity. But this is also, um, this is also something which is primal, uh, primal and uh, uh, here the, you have to put in inelasticity by hand. Uh, I don't know a very, like a very, very clean way uh, where you can really put this complete structure in. It seems like we can put some pieces of it in. Um, in the dual approach, uh, maybe, uh, uh, yes, maybe it is simpler. But, uh, yeah, so there are these few ideas which uh, seem to be interesting and one can explore them and study what is a uh, part put part of the structure in and uh, which we played with, but uh, I don't think there is a very, very clean way to impose this, uh, uh, the structure which comes, comes from uh, imposing elastic unitarity and crossing and maximal analyticity. That's all I can say. Mm, I'm hesitating between going to the two nice questions in the chat or continuing with the people that have the raised hands. So <laughs> let me maybe do one from the chat and then I'll move to, we'll move to uh, Wizuli. So Zohar asks if there is a way of defining an S matrix for massive theories with anions. So this will be uh, something that's very interesting. Is Shiraz here? Maybe he can. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Um, I, I could make some comments on that. Um, you know, they, in uh, a toy model for massive theory with the anions is large n John Simon's theories um, with vector-like matter, which are uh, exactly solvable in um, many things you can you want you can compute in them. So uh, uh, S matrices in these theories have been computed, and um, uh, we know the answers, and they display sort of uh, they, they look very nice but they display some strange um, features. For instance, uh, um, the S matrices that are, uh, that, that are computed, that are unitary, do not obey crossing mm -hmm. symmetry. And uh, by putting some fudge factor, you can make, the, you can make them, make them um, crossing invariant, but then they don't, appear, uh, they, they don't appear to obey at least traditionally formulated unit, uh, unitarity. So this is probably what's behind Zohar's question. Um, it seems like the rules for these S matrices uh, are uh, different. 
And uh, I think it would, uh, it's, a, it's a great question that I, it would be great to have some structural understanding of. It could be, in my opinion, it could be that uh, uh, we have to formulate the problem, the problem question uh, carefully, including understanding what you mean by asymptotic states of these anions, and perhaps including the, uh, taking into account the uh, boundary degrees of freedom of the associated John Simons theory that, you know, whenever you have a John Simons theory in a space with a boundary, you've got these boundary degrees of freedom. And maybe you've got these John Simons boundary degrees of freedom at scry plus and scry minus that are playing an important role, perhaps along the lines of uh, the program that Strom and Jen collaborators have been pursuing. So those crossing matrices are not derived analytically, right? You guess them, some crossing matrices. The crossing matrices? Well, you know, what we get, what, what we did was we computed these S matrices in, uh, um, in a couple of channels. And uh, um, then we, one of, one of the S matrices, uh, okay, where we couldn't compute, we, we, we guessed what we'd have to do uh, to get it to be unitary. Um, that guess changed, uh, made sure that the S matrix was not also crossing invariant. But, you know, there's a lot of checks for this guess. And the checks are basically that, uh, um, that the same fudge factor that we had imposed to make the S matrix unitary works in many different theories. It works for, it works for Bo uh, Boson's couple to John Simons theory. It works for Fermion's couple to John Simons theory. It also works for the supersymmetric, uh, um, supersymmetric Bose Fermi theories or a theory with just a Boson and a Fermion couple to John Simons theory. And the, the unitarity, the nature of the unitarity in these theories is a bit different because different things run in, run in the loops. So uh, I think that the that there is truth to our S matrix. You know, something good is happening there is seems uh, likely to me. Um, so that uh, I think that you would have that you would have to change the rules, the usual rules of the game to deal with these S matrices seems likely. To me. And that the the and. Um, the analytic formulas we have avail available, admittedly with some guesswork, uh, I feel is li likely to lead, you know, would be a template one should stare at to help one. Um, you know, there's, there's also some, sorry, I'm maybe taking too long, but uh, there's also some pictures you can associate with this, with this issue. Right, I mean, um, S matrices in different channels lead, lead to different loopings of uh, Wilson loops if you connect the final particles with Wilson, Wilson loops on the outside. And that gives you a prediction for what, that, that picture gives you a prediction for what the, um, the, the non-crossing um, non invariance of the S matrix should be. And that turns out right in these calculations. So, sorry, I stop you. Uh, Shiraz, can I just follow up by asking, uh, is there a updates uh, regarding this uh, modified crossing at finite n? Um, no, I, I, I unfortunately not. Unfortunately not. Um, I don't know of any. Actually, you know, this it's a place where there's a lot of data because people have done a lot of calculations in uh, uh, for S matrices and ABGM theory. And as uh, many people here will know better than me. Um, um, ABGM scattering amplitudes never sort of uh, gelled the way they should have uh, be because of various issues. I mean, for instance, the pro pro program of computing scattering amplitudes in uh, uh, N equals four Yang Mills theory has gone really far. The ABGM program hasn't gone that far. Uh, one of the issues that people encountered was uh, some puzzles involving, apparent puzzles involving unitarity. And I think that all these puzzles have their, uh, you know, are related to what I'm talking about. The framework is not well set. Uh, at least uh, that would be my answer. I mean, uh, of course, unitarity we expect to hold, uh, but uh, uh, the, the crossing, at least from the point of view of LLZ reduction, uh, you do have to start with green function with rules and lines attached to these charge operators. So one would have anticipated subtlety to begin with from that perspective. Yeah. Yes, and it's precisely that picture that led us to guess this 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 factor for the addition the additional factor for the crossing, and then it worked out beautifully in calculations. Mm -hmm. So, but but as you say that the factor is more complicated at finite n because the Wilson loops don't, you know, crossing Wilson the skin relations that take Wilson loops through each other have more than a phase. And uh, okay, at some point, my collaborators and I came up with some sort of finite n conjecture for crossing, but we were never able to find clear evidence for it, so we never pu published. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
maybe uh, uh, with Zuli, and then we could uh, try to address a little bit the chat. And... Yeah, sorry. Uh, I I want to ask a question. I, I'm a bit confused about the, how do we bound um, Wilson coefficient in, in ADS, uh, like we bound bounded in flash space because I mean, if, to me, I think it's uh, a little bit more complicated for power counting ADS. Like, uh, for example, we have a uh, Wilson coefficient uh, scaling like uh, one over m squared, and we could also um, have uh, one over m to the four times um, ADS readers. So, how do we? I mean, how do we bound? So, it, it it's like a two independent stuff we, we should we should bound yeah, yeah maybe I could comment that the yeah the, the ADS radius effectively goes to infinity in all the things we discussed but uh, if you wanted to bound things like IR curve reserve correction to interactions already probe in flat space I guess that would fall in the category of IR point scattering amplitude. So. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. So if I renormalize by taking out a few minutes from my uh, opening remarks, uh, we are more or less 50 minutes in. Uh, so I, uh, so maybe Juan, do you have any, uh, do, have you seen the chat? There are some comments of the, some, there's, there's some discussion about TT bar. If Juan and Sasha want to, Sergei may, may want to comment on that, but uh, I think that the answer, the short answer is yes. But maybe Sergey can comment on uh, on the fact that city bar uh, is also included. No, you don't want to comment. <laughs> yeah. So so it's in a way it's this flux tube theory can be thought of uh, of um, of this city bar deformation. So I mean the answer of Simon is also the most important. So as long as the amp doesn't grow in the upper half plane, then our ansatz, our primal approach uh, um, is okay, covers it, and, and uh, the bounds we found on the effective field theory allow for this UV behavior. So does, does it allow for it for both signs of the deformation? There, that's what we were discussing in the chat. Um, for the sign which matches bringing in the boundary, at least at large C, where we have approximate locality, um, the bulk theory is always causal, but the boundary theory, I mean, it may be faster to move through the bulk if you send a signal. signal. So the boundary theory might naively appear to lack causality. Um, and in that, that, even that is a case dependent thing. So if you have a, a desider boundary, then it's always faster to move along the boundary um, in terms of causality. So, um, yeah, I think it only works for one sign. This is the sign would be of L string, right? So if if you change the sign, then it will explode in the in the upper half plane, and uh, and that that will not be. Then we cannot derive anything if it's not uh, bounded in the upper half plane. Wait, okay, I'm still trying to understand which sign it is you really have in mind, um, but in terms of other criteria, like or other. Uh, I think a Hageron sign is, the, is a sign which is uh, dumping like. Exponent. Yeah, that's what. Okay, okay. But in the other sign, if you you know truncate to. The other sign is non-relativistic, right? We know that the boundary theory is non non-relativistic. I mean, the signal can go faster than speed of light, so you don't. No, well, well, the boundary. Causality. Yes, yes, but you're talking about bulk causality here, as I understood some of the previous talks, which were. Um, that but only... you also use a, 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 from boundary causality. You can't use it. No, I mean, you can have uh, signals that travel through the bulk perfectly causally. Yeah, yeah, in the bulk, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's perfectly causal in the bulk no matter what um, at large C, even for that sign. Yeah. Um, but the interpretation requires the cutoff in, on both sides, which is, yes. It, uh, yes. Okay, so uh, that's why I'm saying it seems to me um, at that level, it's causal in both cases. Uh, so maybe what's being said here is that the methods somehow pick up the complex energy levels and include those and those blow up somehow. But um, if you uh, if you truncate the spectrum to preserve unitarity, you might not see those, those complex levels causing trouble in your calculations. 
at least I mean I, I'm... yeah we're assuming that tough experiments where you can do scattering at all energies exist and are causal so if you have to truncate the energies of the external states you can't do anything fair enough okay Excellent. So let's thank uh, everyone, and in particular, João and Sasha, especially. <laughs> and uh, let's reconvene at the usual time on the schedule at uh, 140 BRT. <laughs>